here will be that proud pastor of Monumental Baptist Church. Amen. 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 Pastor Christopher Hill, let's give him a hand. Amen. I have to admit that uh, it had been a long time since any of us had seen Pastor Hill. And then when I got in touch with him, got him to come over and be on Pastor's chat. He showed up for our spring revival. Amen. And Pastor Thurston was preaching and he walked in and then Pastor asked me afterwards, he said, where you find him at? I said, what do you mean where I find him at? He said, I ain't seen Hill in so long, I didn't even think he was in the city no more. And to say that is that there was a time where all we saw was Pastor Hill and New Covenant. Every time we looked up, he was there. Amen. And then he faded off. Matter of fact, I got my first cell phone through Pastor Hill. I don't know if you remember. I had that big old brick. <laughs> yeah, I remember that big brick. Hold up. Uh, it get brain damage from that big old thing. Yes. And that's the Pastor Hill helped me get my first cell phone. Right? I mean, y'all know, y'all remember that brick? It was about this big. It was about like this. And then you caught yourself trying to hook it on your side, broke your hip trying to carry that thing. But the thing is, is that it's only God is the individual that can bring individuals back together. And he brings them back together for an appointed time. Because the thing about it is, as Pastor Hill and I talked, I began to find out that we have the same type of passion to see the church do what it needs to do, but do it the right way. Amen. And for so many years, if we were honest with ourselves, churches did things the way they wanted to do them. What they saw was right in their own eyes. Churches have a, have a tendency to go through extremes, don't we? And uh, one of the extremes I think I talked about is Sunday, didn't I, Lisa, when we used to play that name it and claim it game? Yeah. You know, but through it all, one of the things that I know that Pastor Hill stood strong upon his beliefs. When other individuals went in one direction, he stayed that path, direction that the Lord would have him to go. Yeah. And through that is where individuals will begin to walk away from you. Once you begin to stand upon your beliefs. But I thank God that he stood strong. Because he stood strong, God kept him through the years. Amen. So the next voice you will hear after the choir of Monumental Baptist Church comes will be that of Reverend Pastor, Doctor, Teacher. What else you got? <laughs> Theologian, PhD, but most of all, not only is he a friend, but he's a child of God. Amen. So the next voice you will hear will be that of Pastor Christopher Hill. Amen. Amen.
Amen. Amen. Amen. And thank God. Amen. Amen. Thank God. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. What a joy it is for me to be here with members of Monumental Baptist Church. Amen. To come to share here at the St. Joseph Baptist Church Amen. with Pastor Mormon and First Lady Mormon. God bless you. God bless you. Uh, we are glad to be here tonight. You're our neighbor and you have one of the men I respect in this town as your pastor. He's a hard working brother. He uh, the young lady said that he came here running, and, and I'm grateful to hear. I listen for things, especially when deacons talk. I listen for certain things, and I heard the right stuff out of the deacon tonight. Because it's hard to drive a car and get it to go any place. When you stepping on the gas and somebody else is stepping on the bridge. Saint Joseph, seems like you're going to wholeheartedly follow your pastor, and that's the kind of church God blesses. Any church that's fighting against his pastor and messing up his program, they don't get no way. And they have more empty pews than they have people. Amen. But I want you to understand, St. Joseph, you're going someplace. Amen. As long as you follow this man of God. And he is a man of God. He ain't coming up with no strange doctrine. Because I don't hang around with those kind of people. It's too close to Jesus coming for me to hang around with those kind of people. And I want you to know, I'm glad to know that I have a great deal of respect for him. Amen. And Amen. I'm not going to keep you too long because the young lady that was there, she said, you don't need to be coming home all tied to your wife. <laughs> and, the wife and the wife was sitting there and said, that's right. That's right. <laughs> I ain't gonna be the part, sister, morning of him being I and he come on. Amen. 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 And he 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 just a few years younger than I am. So as he get ready to hit the mark, when he get ready to hit the mark, that tiredness come on you more than <laughs> Some old folks say, keep on running. You're so dumb. I'm glad to be in my monumental family that have come with me. Please stand. Amen. 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 Sister, Belma Mona, that's your exercise class. All right. All right. All right. Bless you. Bless your heart. Young ladies, they look like they're ready. <laughs> Greek 
foolishness. But unto them which are called both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God, and the wisdom of God. Mm -hmm. I, I like that. Let me read it again. But we preach Christ crucified unto the Jews a stumbling block. Unto the Greek foolishness. But unto them which are called both Jew and Greek, Christ, the power of God, and the wisdom of God. Mm -hmm. For the time is mine, I want to preach as God shall guide from the thought of foolish and scandalous gospel. A foolish and scandalous gospel. The church at Corinth was one that was filled with unusual trouble. That church had in its midst some, some things that were going on in the midst of the congregation that was causing great trouble. I always remind people, I don't care where you go, uh, there are always going to be trouble in the church. Well, it's just the nature of the, the beast because uh, where, where the devil don't visit no place, he will visit the church. And there are, there are weak members, non-growing members, ineffective members, carnal members of the church that will always have a part in the devil's program. Whenever I say find the works of the devil, I'm always reminded to pray to find the workers of the devil. Uh, because the workers of the devil, sometimes they do more damage than the devil would themselves. Yeah. Somebody ought to hear me tonight. Uh, so Paul writes to this church, this church that's struggling, and let me suggest to you tonight that many of you who are looking for the perfect church and the perfect preacher, perfect pastor, and perfect people might as well quit looking uh, because uh, I don't care where you go even if it's nobody else but as soon as you get into that perfect church it ceases to be a perfect church mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I'm sorry to let you know but God's perfect church is the church that's in glory right now. That perfect church is in glory right now. Uh, Paul had a problem with this church. Uh, first of all, it's not uncommon to the church, uh, the church at 729 East Oakwood Boulevard or 611 East Persian Road or any other church, uh, but there was a major faction of division. Yeah. Uh, that division, as Paul begins to say, that in verse 12, he says, now uh, all people, they have chosen their own personal side. Yeah. Uh, they said, some said, I'm of Paul, and some said, I'm of Apollos, and some says, I'm of Cephas, and the super spiritual group says, I ain't of none of them, I'm of Jesus. Yeah. Uh -huh, uh -huh. But whether or not you understand it, any division in the church is a hindrance to the church. Uh -huh. And I want you to understand tonight that as I stand before you, it doesn't matter who group you think you with. It's the group that's functioning right now that 
God is using and working to bring about change. Uh, they were testifying of past tense. Some of them were talking about the presence of Paul. Uh -huh. Some of them was talking about the present, the past presence of a pilot. Uh -huh. Some were talking about the wishful thinking uh, for Cephas or Peter. Yeah. And others were dealing with the fact of Jesus Christ. Uh -huh. now, now, I want to suggest to you this evening that no matter who in Monumental, they had several pastors before me, and they had pastors before Pastor Mormon. Each of them have their own space and time, uh -huh. and they serve for a season. Yeah. Uh, I, I want you to understand, and I I forgot to let you know that we are being streamed live on the web. So since that be the case, I don't care who you are and where you are in this world. I want you to know that no matter who were your favorites, all of us have our time and our season. But it's a narrow person that cannot get with the present activity that God is working. At the St. Joseph's Church of Chicago, I want you to know Pastor Parrish Mormon is the vessel to which God is using. My heart rejoiced when I heard the deacon say, I'm going to be with you. I'm not going to do everything you say, but I said, I, 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 you know, I, I guess you got to take what you can get, but, but at least his heart is in the right place, and, 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 and he doesn't seem like a trouble pain in the neck, deacon. And he's a brother that he says, this is my pastor. I, I admire this church. I admire this church tonight. Uh, let me tell you, Paul said, now wait a minute. Listen, you can tell what's going on by the mere fact of what is being preached in the church. Now, uh, Pastor Mormon, there's a whole lot of our brethren that want to be so erudite and so prolific until when they come to the pulpit on Sunday morning, they want to preach about Paul Tillich and preach about the great writer Bonhoeffer and they want to preach about all of these amazing people. Uh, but I want you to know, Paul said, now you might be of Apollos, you might be of Cephas, and you might be of somebody else, but I want you to know there is only one gospel that's going to be preached. I know this is a season and a time where there's a variety of gospels out there. Uh, as a matter of fact, it's almost like a Burger King drive-thru. Yeah. If you don't like what's going over, go somewhere else and have it your way. Uh, but I want you to know, just like Burger King, you can eat it. It might satisfy you for the moment, but it ain't nothing that's going to last. And I'm here to tell you, it's better to stick with the real thing. Yeah. Paul says to the church, listen to me. Y'all arguing over this, y'all divided because the preacher don't preach like, the preacher don't preach like Paul, and the preacher don't preach like Apollos, and he don't talk like Cephas, and he doesn't speak like Christ. Listen, let me share with you the reality of this gospel. Uh, because uh, in verse 18 of that chapter it says, for the preaching of the cross yes. is to them that perish yes. foolishness. Uh, uh, but uh, unto us who are unto us who are saved, it is the power of God. Yes. Now, now I want you to understand when I'm talking about preaching, I'm not talking about the worshipful art or the practicing of the movement of delivering 
or the message, the method of delivering the message. Uh, the Greek word preached here deals with the substance of the message. You see, because there are many different styles of preaching. There are many different people that preach many different ways. However, it's the message, it's the substance that is the thing that created it, faith. Yeah. It, it ain't whether he can hoop and whether he can holler or whether he does what the old ladies used to say on the East Coast, the sing song he preaches, and whether he is more of an instructor or whether he is more of an erudite preacher, it's the substance of the message. And a whole lot of folk want to be entertained today. They, they want this entertaining preaching. And, and it's worrying me because many of our churches, especially our young people, are leaving the church because entertainment is not going to satisfy your soul. It's not going to satisfy. It's going to make maybe break through. It's going to maybe make you feel good for a moment. But it's not going to give you the substance that your soul stands in need of. And that's, that's why it's important to have and understand the message of the gospel we preach. Now the gospel we preach, uh, my title suggests uh, something that something's wrong with the gospel. But I want to say no, there's nothing wrong with the gospel. There's something wrong with the hearers of the gospel. Uh, we want to hear what we want to hear, and we want to receive what we want to receive. And I want you to know, so the gospel has become foolish and scandalous. The Holy Ghost wrote down through the Apostle Paul to this church the kind of attitude and mechanism to which people are believing the gospel. Yeah. And, and Pastor Mormon, I see that more now than I did when I was growing up in the church. More now because of this great falling away from the truth, right. falling away from morals, wow. falling away from behavior, right. falling away from personal behavior, wow. falling away from being in good standing, wow. Falling away from trying to be a good Christian. Falling away from us just standing on the promises instead of sitting on the premises. I want you to understand there is a falling away. People are falling away from the church. They're falling out of love with Jesus. They can't stand the preachers. They don't want to hear no sound preaching. They don't want, they want a foolish and scandalous gospel. There are three types of people or three groups of people that God looks at in the world. There is the Jew, there is the Gentile or the Greeks, then there's the church. I don't care all over the world, you fall into one of those categories. You was either a Jew, you're either a Gentile or you're in the church. Yeah. Now you can't be a combination of all of them, but I guess you can't be a Gentile because if you are saved, then you are not considered a Gentile. Right. Uh, Gentiles were considered heathen than unsaved people. A Jew is one that was born directly from the seed of Abraham. Yeah. And he is a direct, he or she is a direct descendant of the tribes of Israel. Wow. But I want you to understand a church, the member of the church, are there any members of the church here tonight? Yeah. We are the ones that have been born by the Spirit of God yeah. and we are saved by Jesus Christ. Yeah. So when the Lord begins to speak and show us the two types 
that he's talking about, and there's really three in these verses. Now, I want to give you the three types. Now, the first type is to the Jew. Yeah. Why is the gospel so offensive to the Jew? Well, uh, let, let me tell you tonight, because it is a stumbling block. Uh, that's the word the King James Bible used. It says it's a stumbling block block. Yeah. Now the word stumbling block translated in the Greek, it means it's a scandal to yeah. them. Yeah. Uh, they don't want to have nothing to do with this Jesus Christ mm -hmm. because he was the product of a scandal. Y'all yeah. uh -huh. uh, know what a scandal is, don't you? Yeah. Uh, listen to the scandal of our Savior. L listen to the scandal that messed up the Jews. How come he was born of a woman that claimed she was a virgin? How come he was born without, and Joseph and the Mary kept the same testimony? The angel said, the angel Gabriel came to her and said, Thou art blessed among women, not above women. I want to straight that out. You're blessed among women, and you are highly favored among women, not above women. That's important that we understand that, especially as Baptists. I want you to know she was blessed among women. In other words, she had a purpose, and she had a calling. But and then they kept saying that she was pregnant by the Holy Spirit. Yeah. The Holy Ghost overshadowed her. Uh -huh. Are y'all with me? Yeah. Yes, when the Holy Ghost overshadowed her, whenever the Holy Ghost overshadows you, when I was growing up, they said, you get happy. Mm. Others said, you have caught the Spirit. Yeah. Others said, you were filled with the Holy Ghost. Yeah. Uh, anybody know what I'm talking about? <laughs> Others said you were baptized in the fire. But she was overshadowed by the Holy Ghost. Yeah. But the one thing we can all agree on is that when the Holy Ghost gets the moving inside you, it makes you alive. Yeah. And I want you to know the Holy Ghost quickened uh, the seed that was implanted in Mary and she brought forth her firstborn child, yeah. even being a virgin. Yeah. I want you to know, I always tell the good folks at Monumental, I tell my family there, Jesus was the only one born who broke the hymen coming out yeah. and not being broke in. Yeah. Have mercy. Right. Do, do I need to pause and let y'all get that? <laughs> I don't want to give y'all a gynecological lesson tonight. <laughs> but a virgin, is, nobody broke the hymen, but Jesus broke it coming out. Right. That means he was born without the aid of man, and she was a virgin. That's a stumbling block. It's offensive to the Jews. Then, being born in a manger, uh -huh. that was unclean. Yeah. They were offended by Jesus. They were offended by him. Like many folks who sit in the church and you preach it past the moment, uh -huh. and they are offended by what you say. Yeah. It's a stumbling block. Uh -huh. It's a stumbling block when you begin to preach against sin. Yeah. It's a stumbling block when you begin to call for right and holy living. Yeah. It's a stumbling block when you don't want all kinds of music yeah. in the house of God. Yeah. It's a stumbling block. It's really scandalous when they have a hard time dealing with certain folks because of their past. And I want you to know, I don't care what a Negro used to be, as long as he's in Christ now, it doesn't matter what you 
used to be. All of us got some kind of scandal. Some of us got seven or eight scandals. Some of us got fresh scandal right now. And, and before that ain't right, how they going to do that? But I'm here to tell you, I tell the Jews, I believe that there ain't no stumbling block for God. I don't care what scandal's in your life, he still changed his life. He turned lesbians into ladies. He turned gay men into proud men. I said he changes the adulterer and make him go home. He turns a drunkard into a deacon and a, and a prostitute into a missionary. He's there to tell the story of Jesus. There's somebody that's been out there. Some of us sit around the church and act like we've been holy all our lives. But I want you to know you are not. You are not. And I'm saying, like I said at Monday night, I ain't your feet stick. You are not. All right now. Sit up. Up these Negroes thinking they've been holy all their lives. Your story just Story, but when it's time to talk about yours, you let us pray. Let us pray. <laughs> to the Jews and to some church folks, uh -huh. the preaching of Christ uh -huh. is a stumbling block. Yeah. Oh, he's getting your business, baby. Yeah. He'll mess in your stuff. Yeah. Yeah. He'll, he'll mess with you. Right where you are. I learned a long time ago. You don't know what you're going to do for this life over. So you better be careful how you tread on other people's lives. I ain't got commentary for nobody else's life. I'm going to preach about Jesus. Then there's the second group. It's the Greeks. The Greeks. That's what the verse says. The verse says to the Greeks this Gospel is foolishness. It's 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 stupid. It's dull. It's a fantasy or a fairy tale. Now now I laugh every time I hear Greeks talking like this by the mere fact of their mythology. Y'all y'all heard of Greek mythology? Uh, Greek mythology is the basis for our present day comic book hero. Or the present day uh, comic book Thor, the god of thunder. And they call themselves intelligent. Zeus, Greek, Odin for the Viking. And that he sits up and he has two sons. Thor and Loki. Yes. Thor is the good son. Loki is the evil son. To, to perpetrate and perpetuate the myth that good and evil are equal in its standing and always running up against each other. The gods uh, uh, that sit on Mount Olympus are always fussing and, and fighting with each other. You've got uh, Poseidon, the god of the sea. You have uh, Mercury, the god of swiftness. Okay. You have Hades, the god of hell. Yeah. You have all kinds of, you have, you have uh, Athena, the goddess of something, and the <laughs> goddess of beauty. You have Medusa. Uh, she, she had, she some, she liked some god, some god liked her, and uh, the, uh, uh, Athena got jealous and made her have hair full of snakes, and every time you look at her, you turn to stone. Myths. Mythology. Mythology. But it encroaches.
touches upon the reality of God our Father. And mythology now, now the Greeks think they got the corner on intelligence because most of our language is formed between the Greek Latin and the Latin Greek uh, uh, verbiage and, and most of our words and especially after Alexander the Great conquered the known world and made everybody speak Greek, even the Jews, and made them write the whole Bible in Greek. And the New Testament is written in Greek. The Old Testament, the Septuagint, was written in Greek. I want you to know they think they're the smart Alex, so they think they have the right to call some things foolish. Yeah. Now, I, want, I, I wanted to give y'all a little history lesson. Uh, because I believe in teaching the people something. All right, all right. I want you to understand the Greeks, the Greeks can't deal with it because the story of Christ is too pure for them. Yeah. Right. They call it foolishness and want to put it in on, on the underneath of their mythical, mythological story. The story of Christ messes with their logical thinking. Yeah. Uh, there's a whole lot of folks, Pastor, who are in our congregation who are eggheads and they believe that they know it all and they have a hard time dealing with the reality of Christ. How are you going to explain that a God that's holy can look at unholy people like you and I fall in love with us, take the essence, take the reality of the second person of the Godhead, wrap him up in a body, send him to earth to live among us for 30 and 3 years, to live a perfect and sinless life, bring him, bounce him on the earth scene through a virgin, and he was a sinless man. The Bible said he never even said a bad word. Yes. Go ahead. Wait a minute, I got to pause. <laughs> he lived 33 years among folks like you and I. And never. Anybody else in here? No, never mind. I want you to know that he, to the Greeks, that was foolishness. How in the world can you handle that kind of love and commitment? We love people for our convenience. You love me, I love you back. Oh, Teddy Pendergrass saying, it's good loving somebody. Yeah. If somebody loves you back, y'all yeah. oh, watch it now. I want you to understand that I want you to understand it messes with your logic. It messes with the logic. How in the world? And, and now there's the rise of, it's always been there, there's the rise of evolution yeah. that cannot believe that a God stepped out on nothing. And the truth of the matter, he didn't have to step anywhere because he's everywhere at the same time. Because he's everywhere at the same time, the Lord spoke. And because he's such an awesome God, he sent his spirit. He didn't have to go. He sent his spirit. And then... Like he hung the stars, the moon, he, he did these things, he made signs and seasons, he did all these wonderful things for us. Uh, am I boring you? No. I want you to know he did the signs, the seasons, stars, he did the planets, the planets all around, he set the sun to rule by day and the moon to rule by night in the economy. When you look at the economy of it, the sun is that the moon is a reflection of the sun that there will always be light given to this planet. Yeah. All right, all right. Woo. Uh, the rest of the planets, the planet is in the right place, tipped on the right axis, spins in the right 
amount of velocity, and it, if it tips a little bit to, to the sun, it, it will burn up. If it tips a little bit away from the sun, it will freeze. And somebody say that our God don't know what he's doing. I want you to know every morning, the morning hasn't been late, the evening hasn't been late. I want you to know that every day, all of a sudden, you wake up by the personal mechanism within your own body. Even before you come to consciousness, something taps you and you come alive again. And the next thing you know, you're waking up to a brand new day. Somebody ought to praise him in here. Here to let you know that like the Greeks said this is foolishness. He that keeps every planet going around his own track. There is nothing called planet. In all the years I've been living, almost 55 years, I ain't heard no planets running into each other. But I see Negroes driving into each other every day. To the Greeks, our message is foolishness. Yeah, yeah. To the Greeks, the preaching of the cross uh -huh. and the preaching of Christ is foolishness. Uh -huh. to, to the world, it's foolishness. Uh -huh. To young people and some old people, it's foolishness. Uh -huh. It's foolishness because it messes with what you want to do. Uh -huh. Because those of us who say know there's only so much we can do without the parameters that the Lord has set for us. Oh, you've been out there beyond the parameters, but you found that you had to come running right back in. You found that there was a waiting and loving God. That messes with people. People don't believe that they can be saved. But I'm here to let you know what was foolishness to the Greeks is not foolishness to us. Because no matter where you are or what you do, God saves everyone yeah, who yeah. calls upon his name. Yeah. And you don't have the patent on that. Only God has the patent. And he will save you yeah. from your sin. Yeah. All you got to do is ask. And that's what messed with the Greeks. Uh, they feel there should be some kind of work involved. There should be some kind of penance. There should be, you got to do something. Sacrifice your first child and, and do all that. But I want you to know with God and his perfect love, there is no, there is no penance you have to do. Everything that we do is not to make God save us. Y'all ready? Right. But it's because he saved us. Yeah. I preach because I'm grateful. Yeah. See, they sang because they're thankful. Yeah. We praise him because we know if it had not been for the Lord on our side. Yeah. Oh, I wish somebody heard me tonight. You see, I, I don't have to be ashamed tonight because I realize something. That others might have a problem because the Lord will offend you. Yeah. Others might have a problem because you can't conceive it in your mind. Yeah. Well, what you don't know is enough to make another word. Yeah. But I'm trusting in a God who knows everything. Yeah. Somebody say everything. Yeah. I said everything. Yeah. I said everything. Yeah. He knows all about you. Yeah. He knows all about me. Yeah. He knows what you're going to do when you get by yourself. Yeah. And he knows what you're going to do when you get around others. Yeah. He knows everything. Yeah. Can you hide from God? No. You just as foolish as the Greeks are. <laughs> Where are you going to hide? David said, if I, if I go to the utmost parts of the earth, you already there. If I make my bed in heaven, you already there. 
if I make my bed in heaven, you're already there. In other words, God is always going where he's already coming from and where he's always there. You can't carry God because he's already there. But he's gone and he's coming back again. And by the time he gets to where he's going, he's already back to where he has been. Confused? That's why I serve him. His ways are beyond finding out. I trust him because I know that since he's got the whole thing covered, did you hear what I said? He got the whole thing covered. And since he's got the whole thing covered, I don't have to scream and holler and say, come by here. All I got to do is say, Lord, we want from you. Yeah. Now, look here. Here's the third group. Third group is in verse 20, at the end of verse 25. And because, I mean, the verse 24, it says, it says, but unto us which are called, both whether you are Jew or a Gentile, Christ is the power of God and the power of wisdom. I want you to know the wisdom of God and the power of God. I want you to know when Jesus died on the cross, and he died for your sins and mine. All right, all right. Did he die for anybody else in here besides me? That used to Pentecostal church and losing their mind when you talk about Jesus Christ dying for you. I don't need you just to sit there. I mean, you need to act like you're in a Pentecostal St. Joseph's Church of God in the denomination of moving Baptist of Christ. I said when he died on the cross for your sins well, that's a praise point right there. Yeah. Uh, that he showed that the power of God right. is mightier than the wisdom and the power of man. Yeah. I want you to know when God is weak, he's stronger than yeah. man. Right. Uh, the mightiness, he was mighty. Yeah. When Christ died, he was mighty. He was mighty. Now, see, many people look at Calvary as a time of defeat. You hear disparaging remarks about how they nailed him to the cross, how they dropped him down, how they beat him the night before, and it looked like God was not in charge. But when you look closely at Calvary, you see that he was a mighty God. Uh, let me say, uh, he hanging on the cross, yeah. death hovering around, yeah. don't know what to do. Yeah. It messed death up so bad till death didn't even want to come near the other two yeah. because the one in the middle was this was a strange situation. Death hovering around, Jesus hanging there. He's saving folks. <laughs> Where's that weakness? I mean, he looks at a thief and said, Today, you're going to be with me in paradise. <laughs> Death sitting there scratching his head. <laughs> then he turns around and prays the prayer, Father, forgive them. For they know not what. You see weakness in that? He all beat up, busted up, tore up, getting ready to give up the ghost and cause and says, forgive them? How many of you would have said, never mind. You said, forget them. <laughs> I want you to know he was mighty in his presence. Even on Calvary's cross. Yeah. He was mighty on the cross. Yeah. He looked down and took care of some family business All right. and created a new relationship uh -huh. and caused Mary to look on him. Don't look at me as your son. Look at me as your savior. Yeah. 
find your son. I'm your savior now. And you got to be saved just like everybody else. Yeah. So woman, behold your son. Yeah. But then he created a new relationship because of the culture. He handled the cultural difficulty. Yeah. She was a woman by herself, so he gave her, instead of to her other sons, he gave her to a believing son and made new relationship. Yeah. Do you see weakness in that? I see the power of God. I see the power of God. Do you think you saw the weakness? He didn't die. He gave up the ghost. No man took his life. He gave his life. When they came around, they saw he was already dead. Because he said, Father, into thy hand, I commit my spirit. They took him down and buried him in the cross. And three days and three nights, he was laying in the tomb. And then early on Sunday morning, the power of God. And now let me clear up a little misconception. The stone wasn't rolled away to let Jesus out. The stone was rolled away to let us in. Because he got up. How can you prove that biblically, Reverend? Well, because later on that evening when they were in the upper room yeah. and they had the doors locked, yeah. all of a sudden they looking around and Jesus said, All oh, hail, yeah. peace be unto you. Yeah. Yeah. Can nothing keep him out yeah. when he want to come in? Yeah. Yeah. And can nothing hold him down yeah. when he wants to get up? Yeah. 